So Matthew chapter 11, we're going to finish last week's sermon. Uh, it was a two-point sermon. You got one of them last week. Here's the second one, all right, as we get in today, all right? So we've been looking at wrong responses. Verse 15, I believe, of chapter 11 in the book of Matthew says this. Jesus is speaking. He's, he's kind of dealt with messengers from John the Baptist. John the Baptist is struggling with wrestling with some doubt. That should encourage you. Of John the Baptist, Jesus says the greatest man who's ever been born of woman, uh, if he wrestles with doubt, if, guess what? When you wrestle with doubt, not that you would give in to doubt, but when you wrestle with doubt, you are in good company. Okay, just FYI. All right, so that takes place here. Uh, Jesus speaks to them, answers kind of their question, then starts talking as they leave, starts talking to the crowd about John the Baptist. And then in verse 15, Jesus says this. Look at what it says here, Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. It says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's culminating what Jesus has said so far, but also introducing what Jesus is going to say next. All right? This is Jesus essentially saying, you need to pay attention to what I'm saying. You need to pay attention to what I'm saying. And last week, uh, we looked at the first of two wrong responses that people were having to Jesus' message, to Jesus' ministry, to Jesus himself. Okay, the first wrong response we looked at last week was childish criticism. And remember, we looked at the weird games they play. They play, they, they, Jesus gave the illustration of kids playing wedding and kids playing funeral. If your children are playing funeral, we might need to talk, um, or you might need to talk to them. <laughs> but, but these are the games they were playing, and essentially, Jesus is making the point, it doesn't matter how, what approach you use with some people, it doesn't matter what tone you use with some people, it doesn't matter how you go about it, some people are going to reject Jesus, and it has nothing to do with anything about Jesus. It has something to do with them, and it's a scary place to be. Okay? That's the first wrong response, childish criticism. And they, they are hiding their rejection with using childish criticism. Okay? Here's the second one. Ready? Here's the second one. Today we're looking at the second wrong response Jesus speaks of. Jesus denotes here. Number Two, wrong response two is intentional indifference. Intentional indifference. Let's look at verses 20 through 24. Are you there? All right, verse 20, we're going to read all the way through 24. Uh, this is a hard passage. FYI, next week it gets way sweeter. Okay, next week we've got, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He talks about the right response next week and the, and the fruits of it. So hang in here with me, okay? It's not all doom and gloom. But sometimes the good news doesn't make sense until you understand the bad news first. Right? You won't take the medicine until you find out you're sick. I'm going to say that again. You won't take the medicine until you find out you're sick, or you shouldn't. Right? Okay? So look at verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. We're coming back to all this. This is rich. Woe to you, Chorazin. Chorazin, excuse me. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Let's, let's see what the Lord would have for us today. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Speak to us. Help us to see potentially in ways that we may be responding similarly to some of these people in these cities, literally the cities, the people who live there, but the city itself. And Lord, help us to change our response if need be, that we would respond faithfully so that we would live faithfully and fruitfully. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you had to make a list of the worst cities in the United States, what cities are on that list? Let's call, let's call some stuff out here. I got Vegas. I heard New Orleans. All right. What? Somebody, oh, I thought somebody said Tennessee. I was like, that's not a city. It's not a city. Come on. Don't you dare say Knoxville. All right. <laughs> All right, D.C., maybe. All right, I heard L.A., San Francisco, right? Some Seattle, right? There's, 
Uh, some people who don't live where we live might say Atlanta, right? There's some rough stuff about Atlanta, right? Um, so we could kind of make a list, okay? If you had asked that question to people in Jesus' time, they would have said, tie our side on Gomorrah, maybe Sodom Gomorrah, right? That's essentially, that would have been basically the list. And Jesus is going to jump off of that and talk, talk about something that these people need to understand and these people need to hear. And, and we need to understand and apply appropriately, okay? Essentially, they're inten- they are intentionally indifferent to Jesus and to his ministry, Okay? This is not like Jerusalem was. Jerusalem responded with, get out of here, we want to kill you. Okay? These cities responded as like, well, you know, let's just be tolerant. Let's be accepting. These cities responded basically, um, well, I mean, we're not going to like kick you out. We like the magic show. Okay? Okay? And Jesus speaks pretty harshly to these cities in his, com- in his current day, and he compares them to some of these Old Testament cities that, we, that he mentioned. All right? So the main issue that's going on here is listed in verse number 20, the very first verse. Look at what it says. It says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. Why? Why? Because they did not repent. I want you to hear that. They did not repent. They, in some ways, they welcomed Jesus into their city, but they did not repent. And so this is where this is coming from, okay? People had seen, they had heard, but they refused to repent. See, the the purpose of Jesus' miracles, of his mighty works, was to confirm and give further credibility to his message. This is not in your notes. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 10. Hold your place right here. Flip over to John chapter 10. We're going to look at two or three verses, then we're going to look at one verse in John chapter 14. Are you there? Get flipping, turn and clicking, however you're doing that today. Doesn't matter to me as long as you see the verse. All right? John chapter 10, probably the most famous verse, or one of the most famous verses in John 10 would be John 10, 10. Well, this is going to be in John 10, beginning in verse 37. John 10, 37. All right? Jesus speaking here in John 10, starting in verse number 37, he says, if I, uh, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. You ever read that? You ever pay attention to that? Jesus says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. In other words, if you don't believe what I'm saying, Let the credibility of the mighty works that God is doing, the Father is doing through me, that I am doing, let that give credence to the message I'm saying so that then you will receive the message that I'm bringing. Look at verse 39. Again, their response, again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. So not receiving it, but the point of the miracles was that. John 14, flip over a a page or two. Click over a... A time or two, John 14, verse 11, Jesus says this. Jesus says in John 14, 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Do you get this? Listen, he's saying, believe that I am in the Father, the Father is in me. He's saying, believe that I am the Messiah, believe that I am the Son of God. If that's hard for you, just look at the mighty works that, that I'm doing. And that should help you get over the hump of your maybe disbelief, okay? So the purpose of these miracles is in part to give credence to the message of the gospel that Jesus is bringing, all right? So back to John, um, back to Matthew 11. So Jesus begins addressing and comparing three main cities in his ministry with three famously sinful Old Testament cities. He's going to compare three cities in his, that he's done a lot of miracles in, a lot of his works, a lot of his teaching. He's going to compare those three cities to these three famously sinful Old Testament cities. Now, these people, they saw, in, the, in these cities, they saw Jesus' miracles, they heard his teaching, but again, they refused to repent, they refused to change. These were people who wanted the blessings, and they wanted the show Jesus brought, but they didn't actually want Jesus. Okay? 
they are going to be judged, here we're going to see, they're going to be judged more harshly than others because they saw Jesus' work and heard his word with their own ears, they saw it with their own eyes, and still refused to repent. In this verse, look here, in verse 20, it says, then Jesus began to denounce the cities. Well, what does denounce mean? It means Jesus essentially, that word can be translated insulted, reproached, reviled, mocked, cursed, maimed, and shamed them. Jesus is getting on to these people. You ever had somebody get on to you? Your, your mom ever get on to you and you deserved it? Right? It doesn't feel good, but you needed it, right? Mamas are like elbowing right now, right? See? Even Eric says it. So, um, essentially, remember before this, we looked at last week, one of the complaints about Jesus. See, he's a friend of sinners. Jesus essentially goes, all right, you don't like me being a friend of sinners? Watch this. Watch this, big boy. Here we go. I'll show you how, we treat, how, uh, how uh, God treats sinners who refuse to turn from their sin. All right? Uh, in this next verse, it says, uh, verse 21, the first verse is woe. This word in its original language is a combination of doom and pity. It's a combination of judgment and brokenheartedness. Some of, my nanny would have said it something, some way like this. She would have said, well, like, bless your heart. Anybody ever, ever heard that? Like, it's like, man, you're dumb. But you're so dumb, you're hurting yourself, and I don't like that either, <laughs> right? Bless your heart, okay? Some of you might say it that way. So the first uh, two cities Jesus, uh, in Jesus' earth, earthly ministry are listed. Look at what it says in verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Let's stop there. So these two cities, we, we don't know a lot about the first one, Chorazin. Uh, it's only mentioned here, and the fact that it is mentioned, but only mentioned here, is proof of John chapter 21, 25. Let me read to you John 21, 25. I bet you've heard it before, okay? This is what John 21, 25 says. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So, we don't know any specific miracles or different things that happened there. It's only listed here, but obviously something happened there, and uh, apparently enough of something that it was a big enough deal that Jesus includes it in this list. We're going to assume that that's part of what John is referencing in John 21, 25. So Bethsaida, let's look at this one. Some things that happened in Bethsaida. Jesus healed the blind men there. It's, it's referenced in Mark chapter 8, 22 through 26. Jesus walked on the water on the way there. Jesus healed many sick there. The feeding of the 5,000 with 12 baskets left over was close to there. And essentially, both of these cities, after seeing, after hearing, after participating in different ways about these different miracles and these different things that happened, hearing Jesus' words also, refused to repent. They didn't ask him to leave. They didn't kick him out. They were just indifferent. Well, eh, looks pretty cool. Maybe he'll do something new again but they refused to repent even after all this. Well, now let's look at the first two Old Testament cities. We'll get to um, the last part of verse 21. It says, For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. One of the things we need to be aware of here is that Jesus in his sovereignty knows what would have happened if circumstances had been different. But in his goodness and his sovereignty, he also is right and righteous in how he does what he does. Some people will read this and go, well, how come he didn't do that for those cities? Well, that kind of puts us in the place of God as if maybe we know more than God does. God, you should have done it the way I think it should have been done. You ever done that in your life? You ever wrestle with that? I think we all have. If you're not nodding, like maybe you're not listening. All right. I think that's a, a common struggle, a common battle that we have, that we want God to work the way we want him to work, when we want him to work, right? But what, one thing that we can do, this is further application here, we'll get to some applications at the end of this, but one application is let's trust what God does and how he does it. We need to learn to grow in that, and we need to learn to trust that. He's God, he knows, you don't, I don't, right? Okay, so these uh, first two Old Testament cities listed, all right? 
to the Galilean Jew, Tyre and Sidon, epitomized pagan, Gentile corruption and worthlessness. The people in these cities were descendants of the ancient Phoenicians. Uh, They were renowned seafaring merchants and colonizers of the Mediterranean. Both cities were typical seaports, uh, and one pastor says they are noted for their immorality and godlessness, even by pagan standards. In other words, pagans would have looked at them and gone like, oh, that's pretty rough over there, right? That's, that's kind of the picture here. And then we're deeply involved in Baal worship. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? That's, that's where a lot of this even came from, okay? So, a certain king of Tyre is listed in Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 15. And let's, you, this king is so evil and proud that Ezekiel used him as an illustration, a picture of Satan. And that's the king of Sidon, okay? Or of Tyre, excuse me. The city's violence, profanity, pride, injustice, greed, and immorality were so excessive that the Lord destroyed the cities. It had even, uh, these people had even sold many of God's own people into slavery. You look at Amos 1.9 as a reference for that. So pretty bad cities, pretty bad places, right? Uh, for Sidon, another kind of fun fact, Jezebel was from Sidon, okay? Not a claim to fame, by the way. Not like, cool, like we, like not a good thing, all right? These are horrible, evil, sinful wicked places that God chose, you know what, it's better for me to destroy these cities and everyone who lives them in them than to let them go on. God in his goodness and his sovereignty, knowing all the things that we don't know, knew it was better for those cities and those people to no longer exist. And Jesus just said, Woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus says these cities would have repented if they had seen and heard what Chorazin and Bethsaida saw and heard. Now, look at verse 23. We're skipping uh, part of uh, 22, or 22. We'll come back for it. Look at verse 23. Here's another city. Here's, a, here's the third contemporary city of Jesus that's listed. Look at verse 23. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So now he's comparing Capernaum to Sodom. So let's see what we know about some of these places. Well, first of all, Capernaum. Capernaum was Jesus' Galilean headquarters. This is essentially Jesus' new earthly home. This is his base of operations. Okay, some things we know um, about Capernaum. Jesus often spoke in their synagogue. Uh, the man with a withered hand was healed here. The demon possessed, uh, demon possessed was delivered. A paralytic was dropped through the roof and healed in this city. The mother-in-law of Peter was healed of her fever in this city. The daughter of Jairus was brought back from the dead in this city. The woman with an issue of blood was healed in this city. Two blind men regained their sight that we know of in this city. The mute demoniac was delivered in this city. The centurion's servant was healed in this city. A lot of things we know of took place in Capernaum. But Capernaum is listed in the cities that saw and heard much of what Jesus did and said without repenting. Jesus is comparing Capernaum to Sodom. We'll look at Sodom in a minute. That's where the most part of the PG is coming in, just FYI. Okay? In verse 23, where Jesus says, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted into heaven? He's mockingly quoting Isaiah 14 here, where God mocks and taunts the king of Babylon. Jesus is taking that, and he's applying it here to Capernaum. Like, Capernaum, you think you're hot snot? Right? You think you're, you think you're like whatever? You think you're the stuff? Just because this is, you're my base of operations? and you get looped in just because I set up here, Uh uh-uh, you still have to respond faithfully. Let Let me cut to one application here. Just because you grew up in church doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. 
You have to make your own personal decision to trust and follow Christ. I have a friend that used to say, just because you're at McDonald's doesn't make you a happy meal. Right? Just because you're at church doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. It just makes you, sometimes, especially in the South, it can become like this cultural thing. It's just what we do. It's like we're church. We're not Christians. We're church in. And that's sad that it would be that way. But listen, if Capernaum could be in the physical presence of Jesus and refuse to repent, don't think God doesn't see you just because you're at church. If you refuse to repent. So this is, this is heavy what he's saying here. Okay? Today, these three cities of Jesus' earthly operation, essentially today, you know what they are? A desert wasteland. There's, uh, there's, some, um, there's some commercialism because people are coming uh, like we will be doing next year going to the Holy Land, seeing some of these things. There's some, there's some tourism, but aside from that, essentially these places are rough. And you see even now part of the judgment upon the, the physical locations. All right? So, again, these cities didn't rise up like Jerusalem. They were just cold. They just were indifferent. They were apathetic. Their perspective was, hey, cool, do another miracle. We want to see something else. That was, their, that was their kind of position. Let's look at the last of the Old Testament cities. Yeah. As, as we think about this, essentially this is all these cities that were in Jesus' earthly ministry, their theme would have been more like Hakuna Matata. We're good, just no worries. Just float along. But that was the wrong response. All right, so the last city listed is Sodom. Look at, again, verse 23. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Now listen, Sodom was destroyed. God literally rained from heaven onto the city and destroyed it. Okay? So, Sodom, you can read about Sodom in Genesis 18 and 19. Um, even in the secular world now, Sodom is a synonym for moral depravity and has the infamous distinction of lending its name, the, the term sodomy, to the most extreme forms of sexual deviance, including homosexuality and bestiality. Evil. When a group of Sodom's worst perverts tried to rape the angels at Lot's house, they were struck blind. And after they were struck blind... Their homosexual enslavement was so intense that afterward they wearied them. The Bible says they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. They didn't give up. Hey, we're blind. Maybe we can still find them. And they, they literally wore themselves down to the point because they were still trying to find it. Because they wanted to satisfy their perverted lust. The Sodomites would have, uh, according to Jesus the Sodomites would have a better experience in hell than those in Capernaum. If they had seen and heard what Capernaum had seen and heard, Jesus says they would have repented and the city would still have been there at this time. It's heavy stuff. So, what we see, we see the justice of God being upheld here in this text. What's, what is right will take place. Hear me. Here's the ultimate point Jesus is trying to make. Ready? Let's cut to the chase, and then we'll look at some applications. Rejecting Jesus is worse sin than sodomy, than homosexuality, than adultery, than any sexual sin, period. Then it's worse than slavery. It's worse than any injustice. It's worse than murder. It's worse than theft. It's worse than violence. What offends God most is rejecting his son. And listen, Rejecting his son includes, well, I'm just going to not make a decision. I'm just going to not make a decision. I'll just kind of sit here on the fence. And like, I'm not anti, but I'm not pro. <coughs> Same difference. That's rejection. God's word here also is teaching degrees of eternal judgment. 
Jesus says it, would ha- it will be better for these, like, the Jews' mouths would have been on the ground, y'all. Hear me. The Jews would have heard this and been like, what are you talking about? What? It's wor- it will be better for these cities in hell than it will be for us? Jesus, like, we're, we're your boys. Jesus, like, we, we ate dinner together. We did this. We went on this mission trip. We served at kids camp. We, we attended church. We helped in children's ministry. I don't know. If something will get you to heaven that works, that's close. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Children's ministry is awesome. That was a joke, by the way. Right? Jesus, we did all this stuff. You're, you mean to tell me what? God's word here is teaching literally degrees of eternal judgment based on what you did with the access to the gospel you had. It's here. We'll look at it. So, one question that often comes up, let's kind of, let's dig in just a little bit. One question often, often comes up is, okay, what about those people who have never heard the gospel? What about those people who have never heard the gospel and so they, they didn't receive Jesus because no one ever told them? Hold your place right here. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1. Um, I think this is appropriate for us just to take a, we're going to take a two-minute sidebar here, maybe even less than that. I just want to read these, these texts here and, and make sure that we have a, um, a faithful understanding of what this doctrine is. Okay? Romans 1, we'll look at 18, 19, and 20. I think that'll get us. Romans 1. So, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay? All. What does all mean? All, that's all, all means all the time, right? All, okay? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Well, wait a minute, what if they've never heard? Have you ever heard the phrase that ignorance of the law is no excuse? I didn't know. Well, the text starts addressing some of that. Look at what it says in verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Well, how has he shown it? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. I want you to hear me. It is harder for a person who has never heard the good news of Jesus to put their faith in Jesus but because of God's creation, we should be able to look and go, okay, this didn't get here on its own. The fact that it exists means there had to be a creator. The fact that you are sitting in this room and you look around and you see this building is evidence of a builder. It would be ridiculous for someone to go, you know, there was just this explosion and poof, out came this building. It's miraculous. And, right? So these, these people are without an excuse of understanding that there is a creator. So someone who has never heard because someone has never told them is without excuse, but I'm going to tell you, their judgment, their punishment in hell forever will not be as bad as those who came every Sunday morning, heard the good news of Jesus, and said, no, I'm good. Not as bad. Based on what Jesus says here in Matthew 11. Does he not say, verse 22, but I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Verse 24, but I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. In other words, the judgment that is pronounced and the corresponding outplay of that judgment will be comparatively more bearable for those who have never heard because guess what? We didn't tell them. That's on us. But it will still be judgment. And Jesus is saying, he who has ears to hear, 
Let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This degrees of suffering in hell is similar to degrees of reward in heaven. We are taught that heaven is not a communist society. It's not everybody gets the same. No, you are rewarded, you receive reward upon, based upon your faithfulness. Not based upon, well, how many sermons did you teach? Because guess what? You didn't get what I got. I didn't get what you got. How you serve the Lord with what you did get determines your reward. You get that? Well, in the inverse perspective, how available and how, how the access you have to the gospel and how you respond to whatever access you have to the gospel and you still reject it will determine how bad hell is. Jesus says that here. It, bear, it lines up with Scripture. So, let's look at some principles here. One pastor says it like this. I'm reading. This is not Eric. This is another pastor. I'm going to read this to you because I couldn't do better than this. Okay? Are you out there? Okay. All right. So, one pastor says it like this. One, the more light you have, the more knowledge you have, the more truth you have, the worse your sin and pun punishment at rejecting it. Number two, the more kindness God shows you, not just in giving you light and truth, but in, for example, giving you many undeserved pleasures in this life, the more grievous your unbelief and sin, and the worse your punishment in hell. We'll, we'll, we'll dig down on that in just a second. Three, if rejection of more and more light and kindness makes suffering worse in hell, then this pastor says, then I infer that the more days you do this, the worse it will be. This is assuming you never trust Christ. In other words, time comes into the picture. Day after day after day, you keep on rejecting light after light after light, kindness after kindness after kindness. The longer this goes on, the worse things are going to be. Four, there are kinds of sins that are more heinous, more destructive, more blasphemous than others, so that not only the amount of sinning over time makes things worse, but also the degrees of ugliness and horror, heinousness and blasphemy also increases the suffering. Five, in all of this, there is a greater or lesser degree of high-handedness, arrogance, greater arrogance, greater conscious defiance and insolence, and therefore a consequent greater degree of punishment. You get that? In other words, the more aware you are that you are rejecting the truth, even if your form of rejection is, well, I mean, I'm just going to sit here. I don't have to respond. I, 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 can, I can throw an amen out there every now and then during the sermon. I can, I can sit in the congregation. I can kind of blend in and hide. And I'm not, I'm not out here like, like preaching against. But I'm just going to kind of ride the wave and we'll get wherever we get. This is scary. Potentially for some of us in this room. But this is also scary because of some of us in this room, we love people, some of them maybe our children. Some of them may be our grandchildren, and they have heard the gospel over and over and over and over. And they've said, no, I don't believe it. I won't submit to it. No. Jesus says here, by, by comparison, we're drawing this out, the judgment for Sodom will be more bearable than for the person who sits in the congregation week after week after week year after year after year and gives God the Heisman and says, no, not for me. I'm not going to preach against it, but I'm not receiving it. And y'all, that scares me. That breaks my heart. And I think we need, to, we, need, we need to respond to this. We need to respond to this. Some, some of you right now in this room, that's you. Some of you right now in this room, that's been your life. Don't store up 
more judgment if you reject Christ and never receive Him, it would have been better if you hadn't heard this today. But you did hear it. Praise God. So respond so that you don't have to bear that judgment. So you don't have to receive what you deserve. Instead, you can receive grace. Listen, what do you have to do to go to hell when you die? Nothing. Nothing. You can just stay the way you were, stay the way you are, ride the wave. Nothing. So some applications. Some of these line up with the first five things I just read here. One, we need to seriously and vigilantly not misuse what God has given us, the awareness and the access to truth that he's given us. We need to take it seriously and respond faithfully. Luke 12, verse 48 says, To whom much is given, much will be required. Second, we should be seriously vigilant not to misuse the pleasures that God gives us in this life. What we are tempted to do is begin worshiping our finances, worshiping our trinkets, worshiping those pleasures, and we wind up serving them and worshiping them instead of worshiping God. We turn them into idols. Well, I mean, I would, I would follow the Lord, but man, I really like how comfortable this is. I would follow the Lord, but ah, that means that I might have to give up some of what I like. And, and this, these pleasures, these comforts, this this power, this position, I would have to give that up. I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. We need to be careful not to misuse those. They're meant to help us see the goodness of God, not to turn us against God. Three, we should seriously be vigilant over every passing moment so that they don't accumulate sins that would bear up against us if we reject Jesus. Every passing moment that we stay where we are and we, don't have, we have not put our trust in Christ, every moment will be called into account against us. Four, we should be seriously vigilant over our pride, lest we fall into patterns of arrogance and defiance and say it doesn't matter, God can take his word and stuff it. And just as a sidebar here, apparently geographic or maybe even national repentance literally a thing that's been something that's kind of played out where some some christians have said well i mean how can a nation even repent well apparently the cities could repent because jesus calls them out for not doing it you know what essentially that looks like at some point we looked at it last week in in uh in nineveh right the message got out it gets to the it gets to the king the message would get to the leaders. The leaders would repent and issue a decree that the nation should do so as well. It's a thing. Don't argue with me. I didn't write it. Further applications here. Our presence at any particular religious event does not equal our faithfulness. It does not equal our salvation. Another one. Question. What have you done with what God has given you? Follow-up question. What are you doing? Not, well, I mean, I did that, and now I'm retired, so I'm just kind of retired from everything. Eh, wrong. Are you breathing? Three of you think you are. Awesome. I don't know, this sermon's long. Are you breathing? If you are breathing, God's not done with you yet. You're not retired. You might have retired from your vocation, but you ain't retired. You're in the kingdom. You're a citizen. Right? What are you doing with what you've had? Are you in your own Chorazin, Bethsaida, or Capernaum this morning? It's a scary place to be, y'all. Listen. If you've never trusted Christ, every song you've ever heard played about Jesus, every prayer anyone has ever prayed in front or for you, every sermon you've ever heard, every time someone's witnessed to you, 
will be involved in the judgment that you receive. So, stop playing church. Stop playing church. Let's get busy about what God has for us. So, since all this is true, very briefly, how we should also respond. Guys, we've got to boldly take the good news to those who have little to no access to it. There are still unreached people groups all across this world. The church of Jesus Christ has got to take seriously the command that we have been given to take the good news to everyone, to the ends of the earth. Second, we must also boldly and passionately share the good news again with those who, although they have much access to it, have still rejected Jesus. But we must also include this message so that they know every time they hear, if they reject Jesus, it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse for them. Please trust Christ. We must boldly and passionately take the gospel. We can't choose for them. It must be their choice, but they must hear. They must hear and be given an opportunity to lovingly put on the, on, kind of called on the, on the carpet and say, so that they would say yes or no. And we pray. God's people pray. Because we can't motivate them by how good we share but the Spirit of God can prepare their heart to receive. So we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray. We said earlier, what must you do to be condemned to hell? Absolutely nothing. Be born, live, die. That's going to happen to everybody. What must you do to be saved? Turning from your sin, trust Jesus. So every time you hear God's word, don't just sit quietly. Don't just bow your head at the end. Don't just sit and stand during the invitation time. Don't just exchange pleasantries with those around you on the way out. Don't just walk to the car, go to lunch, drive home, and continue in the normal activities of life without trusting in Jesus. Don't sit here and ignore sin in your life. Don't do the same thing week after week, month after month, year after year, and then die in your sin. And wake up in the lake of fire with weeping and gnashing of teeth, lost forever, with at that point no second chances, no opportunity for salvation. But instead, trust Jesus. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. This is what he says in Matthew 7, part of Matthew 7, verse 24. It talks about the difference between those who are, have their house built on the rock and those with their house built on the sand. Remember being in children's church, Sunday school, if you grew up in church and hearing that, right? What's the difference between those two people? How do you have your house built on the rock so that when the storms and wind and everything comes, it doesn't blow it down, versus having it built on the sand, same storm, same wind, same, same everything else, well, the house falls. How do you, what's the difference between those two? Well, the picture is, the difference between those two, Jesus says, he or she, essentially, who hears these words of mine and does them, and does them, will be like a man whose house is built on the rock. So, what will you do with what you've been given? What will you do with what you've been given? Let me end with this quote and, and give you one, maybe last, chance to respond. And I say maybe last, not to sensationalize this. It's literal. We don't know. We don't know when the Lord's coming back for us. We don't know when this life will end and we're going to Him. But it is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. It's going to happen. What have you done with what God has given you? Last quote from Jonathan Edwards. It says, he says, The damned in hell would be ready to give the world 
if they could have the number of their sins to have been one less in this life. Just think about that. They would be ready to give the world just to have one less sin to answer for. Guys, this is, this is hard. This is not fun sermon time. But we have to be faithful to the text, and I want you to hear me today. Ready? If you've never trusted Christ, there's no middle ground. Jesus says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Jesus says that. Every person in this room, every person who will ever hear my voice, of like the three times this might ever get played on YouTube, and it ain't me, I don't enjoy going back. I probably should, I'll get better if I did that. We all deserve the judgment of God because of our sin. Did you know this in Romans, I think chapter 2, it uses a word that Jesus uses in Matthew. Remember when Jesus says, store up, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, those things don't corrupt, they don't destroy. Romans 2 uses the exact same original word when it talks about storing up God's wrath same word every person who will ever hear this message you and I we deserve the judgment of God we deserve it you're listen you you might be a nicer more gentle kinder more serving person than me but we deserve both the just and righteous judgment of of God. We deserve it. We're done. John 3 says that we are condemned already as we come into this life. But God, who is rich in mercy, can make you alive. See, He can take the judgment that you and I deserve He's, he's poured out all that wrath on Jesus already. The wrath that we stored up that Romans talks about, it's been poured out on Jesus. Jesus took the penalty. It would be stupid of you. It would be foolish of us to not receive the gift that Jesus has already paid for. Knowing the longer we reject it, the more times we hear if we still reject it and we die that way, we're going to get all the judgment for it. There's not going to be, well, God, I didn't know. Well, what you did know, you received judgment over. Well, guess what? We have the blessing and benefit that we get to hear this and share this freely. But... What does Spider-Man say? And I would say with great access to the gospel is great accountability. Church family, we deserve the judgment of God, but God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes on Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. You might still have questions. Guess what? I still ask stuff all the time. God, well, what about this? Help me, I don't, I don't, help me understand this, God. I have that all the time. All the time. And you're probably smarter than me, so you'll have more questions. But what I do know is this. I was dead in my sins and my trespasses. I had gone where I shouldn't have gone. I had done what I shouldn't have done. And I knew it was wrong. I didn't know how wrong, but I knew it was wrong. Because God's put that awareness in each of us. We've got a conscience. 
And although I didn't fully understand how wrong or why, I understood it was wrong. And I did it anyway. And so did you. So we deserve God's judgment, but God sent Jesus. And as a 17-year-old young man, I turn from my sin and I put my faith in Jesus. And yes, there are things I still have questions about, but let me tell you what I do know. I was dead and now I'm alive. The blind man said, essentially all these questions you have, I don't, I don't know what you might say about Jesus, but here's what I do know. I was blind, now I can see. I was dead and because of Jesus, now I'm alive. And I want you to hear me. You can be too. And if you have trusted Christ, can I tell you, there are people all around you in this community. Listen, coming Georgia is like the belt buckle of the Bible belt. Y'all know that, right? Like right smack dab in the middle of it. People think Texas is. They are wrong. Okay? I have a pastor friend that says Texas, parts of Texas, not all. Where's not all. He says, Texas is like the armpit of America. That's what he said. He didn't like it when he lived there, apparently. Coming I mean, Georgia is not that. It's beautiful. It's blessed. It's blessed with access to the Word of God. But listen, there are more people that don't know Jesus out there than there are people who do know Jesus in all the churches this morning. What are you doing about that? What are we doing about that? We better be doing something. Why? But, well, because we know. Because we know. So are we being faithful as followers of Christ with what we also know? If you've never trusted Christ, today's the day. From your heart to the heart of God, confess, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I turn from my sin put my faith in you. You might even just simply say, Jesus, I trust in you. Save me. If you are a follower of Christ, are you and I taking seriously the purpose God has for us in this life to be disciple makers? Or are we just kind of riding the wave now? Like, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Yeah, you're going to heaven. Who are you taking with you? By God's grace, who are you taking with you? What are you doing with what God's given you?